thank you, Victor, for the introduction and for and for the invitation. Also, thank you, Mohamed. Um, so very happy to be here, and I guess it's a great timing to um, to present this paper on demographic change and development from crowdsourced genealogies in early modern Europe. Uh, right after the discussion we just had, um, I very much agree with all all the points that were raised. But but I think we can we can get. Um, pretty nice insight from, from genealogies, especially in periods without censuses. Okay, so in this paper, I, I study demographic change and development um, using a novel crowdsourced genealogical data set to study populations in the past and in periods without census, especially in the 18th century. Um, I do that with millions of observations, uh, depending on what I look at, sometimes uh, hundreds of thousands of observations, from publicly available genealogies. Um, second, I, I do a very careful evaluation of sample selection. And I show that sample selection is somewhat limited, at least in the 18th and 19th centuries um, in Europe, uh, which is a time when, um, when parish records are widely available for um, for people to look at to uh, search for their ancestors. Um, and, and, I, and I do that by comparing crowdsource data with census data whenever available. And I, and I show that uh, what, what, what we get from that is that there is very similar evolution in, in both uh, types of data. Um, and finally, because I mean, initially that was really a data paper, but I, I also wanted to, to have, you know, to document some stylized facts and also to uh, to reconstruct things that we already know, just to see, you know, to validate the data. And so as an illustration of what can be done, I, I document some of some stylized facts. Uh, especially I do that at the European level, and I find large aggregate gains uh, at the European level, uh, large demographic changes. And at a more disaggregated level, I find important changes in the 18th century. And I find, uh, I, I can document some uh, somewhat novel stylized facts uh, with this data. Um, okay, so let's let's go into the data um, and and so an overview of what the what what is where it comes from. So this is individual level data from genealogists, and basically it consists in all publicly available profiles on the website uh, genie.com uh, with geocoded place of birth and death and intergenerational links. The data was scrapped by Kaplanis et al, a computer scientist uh, in a paper published in Science in 2018. And it relies on individuals reconstituting their family tree by searching through scanned records of birth, marriage, death, and publicly uploading the data online. Um, you know, they think the, the, the data is, is private, but it's actually public. And, and then these guys, Kaplanis et al, they, they just go and scrap everything. Um, and they also um, uh, did like a careful um, matching uh, in order to not have duplicates in the trees. Um, <clears throat> so what I do with this, uh, first I match it to uh, current not European regions uh, because the original geocoding was a huge mess. And also I match it importantly to town level time varying uh, baroque data on historical urbanization uh, because this is sim simply because this is the best available measure of uh, proxy of development at a very granular level and that's uh, available comprehensively over over time and space in Europe uh, during that time period <coughs> and this is an important step in order to match the data to other data sets uh, to look at the effect of some town level or regional level variable on, on demographic outcomes, which, which is something that people could do with this variable, uh, with this data. Um, second, I generate a measure of completed fertility from vertical and horizontal lineages. So I will, I will come back to that in a, in a second. And, and finally, uh, sorry, finally, because uh, some countries are overrepresented in the data, especially Scandinavian countries that have such great uh, uh, you know, raw sources. Uh, observations are reweighted to account for the overrepresentation of some countries. <clears throat> okay, so um, it's great because we've already talked about that, but I, I will go a bit more into detail. The, the alternative to using the genealogies is uh, lineage reconstruction or family reconstitution. 
pioneered by Louis Henry and by Wrigley in, Louis Henry in France and, and Wrigley and Scofield in England. Um, and basically, you know, it's already been evoked in, in here, uh, but basically consists in family reconstitution um, in rural pa parishes from birth, marriage, and death records. And so basically, um, they, uh, they went to uh, one specific parish and they would reconstitute like the life histories, life trajectories of each individuals uh, that lived in that parish at some, at some point in time. Um, there are, okay, I, I should say here, I'm gonna talk about the issues, but there are many great points about this uh, that have been raised by, uh, by Lionel right before, but there are some issues. Um, first, it is a very tedious thing to do. It is costly, it is very time consuming. Uh, it is imperfect because of the nature of the data. Uh, and finally, it is not scalable and it is not representative. Um, again, this is not to, um, you know, there are many great points with, with, with this type of data, but, but we should keep in mind those issues. So first, uh, very poor handwriting in records, uh, they're hard to decipher. Uh, so, you know, we, we've already seen a parish record. Uh, here you can see some other in the, in the 18th century, basically. Uh, it's messy, it's hard to, you know, hard to understand what's there. And, and you know, users of genealogical websites uh, will not necessarily do better than demographers, but they can have an incentive because, um, because they're looking at their own ancestors. Um, second, records provide very imperfect information and they need a lot of extra work to be cross-validated. So we've already talked about that. Uh, the names can change, age or age or date of birth is not always provided. The dates are rounded up, and so basically, you know, it's very hard. Uh, if you see uh, if you see uh, Jean Dupont in, in in one parish record, then it's going to be very hard to match it, you know, to uh, to the birth uh, or marriage record of that person. Um, and and very important selection and representativeness. Only small rural villages can be studied, and therefore there is no spatial variation. Which is an issue because if you want to look at the effect of, you know, some variable on on demographic outcomes, on fertility, uh, or on life expectancy, or whatever, uh, you know, having individual level records is great, uh, and and you can do a lot of stuff. But if you don't have any spatial variation, you're going to be very limited. Um, and 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 finally, related uh, migration is not taken into account and creates uh, completeness issues. So. <clears throat> Essentially, geneal genealogical data is, is crowdsourced uh, lineage reconstruction. Um, so just a, a, a quick uh, summary of the sample. There are two samples uh, that I'm going to be looking at. Uh, the first one, the main sample, consists in all individuals who were born or died in Europe in this data. Uh, so there are roughly 10 million observations after 1400. Among which about seven millions uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries, and I'm going to focus on the 18th and 19th centuries because these these will be the periods during which selection into the sample is limited. I'm not going to say there's no selection, but selection is limited. And second, um, the fertility sample, which is going to consist in, in, of individuals in the main sample with a recorded fertility and for which the genealogical tree has a fully recorded horizontal lineage. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna give more details on that, uh, but basically I'm, I'm gonna impose like a little trick in order to, um, to select those people uh, for which uh, I think uh, the fertility uh, that is, the absurd fertility is their actual level of fertility or at least close to. Uh, and so for these uh, guys in the fertility sample, uh, I have about eight, 800,000 observations after 1400, among which uh, 500,000 uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, okay. So going back to the fertility, uh, which, which I'm, I'm gonna focus a lot in this talk, uh, an important issue is that fertility not only requires a knowledge of the vertical one, of the vertical lineage of the uh, direct uh, lineage, but also it requires a knowledge of the horizontal lineage, right? Because when 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 people look at their ancestors, uh, most of them are actually interested only in their direct ancestors. They only look at the direct lineage, the vertical one, 
and they do not necessarily go on the horizontal branches. Um, and if they don't go to the horizontal branches to their uh, great great cousins and so on and so forth, then the, you will just observe the fertility of one, 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 right? Um, and, and this will be, of course, this will be biased uh, because this will not be the actual level of fertility of these people. And so what, what we want is, is the people, uh, the, the individuals looking at their ancestors to actually carefully record the horizontal branches of, of their lineage. Um, and so I deal with this issue by defining the fertility sample, which is a sample for which there is a good reason to believe the horizontal lineage of a person has been recorded. And, and I impose one criterion on, 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 on the data. Uh, basically, I look at uh, one individual I, and if at least one ancestor of I in the four preceding generations, excluding I, is recorded with a fertility that is strictly greater than one, that is different than one, then I will just assume that for that individual, the observed fertility of that individual will be his true level of fertility. Um, so basically, if you know, if uh, these uh, this couple they had uh, they are recorded with uh, two children in the data, then I will assume that the person that looked at uh, the the, the individual that recorded the ancestor that recorded the tree uh, carefully uh, recorded the horizontal branches and therefore uh, whatever is the fertility level of individual I is in the data, this will be his true fertility level. Um, okay. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a map showing the, the spatial distribution of, of places uh, for which we have at least one one observation in the data. Um, so this is not so great because in France you have, for example, in France you have 36,000 towns and they're all very small. Uh, you know, if you go to Sweden, uh, towns are much larger, but, but basically uh, what you can get from that is that in Southern Europe, the data is not as good. And basically the more North you go, the better it gets. But, but we'll see that when we, when we look at simple selection too. Uh, okay, which is what we do now. Okay. so. The, the main thing you should uh, remember is that selection to the sample is limited. I mean, that I will show you the selection to the sample is limited uh, based on observable measures. Uh, so adult life expectancy, urbanization, and fertility are things that we can look at in this data. Um, and so to what extent? So I, I compare the Pratt sourced uh, data with representative data, again, whenever available for each country. So I have 30 countries in the data. And I do that in a systematic manner using uh, the human mortality database, uh, mostly based on census, to look at life expectancy and to compare it to the crowdsourced genealogies. Uh, for urbanization, sorry, for urbanization, I, um, I look at uh, BROC data uh, and census data um, to compare it to the genealogies. And finally, for fertility, I look at Colin Watkins data. Um, <clears throat> And, and what I do is that I, I just correlate in this table, I, I show the correlation for each region in Europe. I'm, I'm not showing it for 30 countries. I am aggregating uh, the countries to, uh, to some regions, so British Isles, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, France, it will be just one region because, because I'm French, uh, Northern Europe and Southern Europe. And basically this is showing for each dimension, urbanization, life expectancy, adult life expectancy, uh, and fertility, what is the correlation at the country level with the representative data? Uh, this is just showing correlation. We're also interested in levels, right? Uh, so there is a very high correlation for, for these, all these regions, but, but also in levels, we find uh, very similar results. Again, the, my goal here is not to say that there's no selection. Of course, there's a lot of selection, thousands of ways selection could operate, but it's actually somewhat limited. So here um, at the level of Europe, this is looking at, um, at mortality. Uh, so in the human mortality database uh, in pink and in the crowdsourced data in, in blue. Um, okay, so at the level of Europe, still looking at the rock data um, uh, in, in pink again, and in blue, uh, this is showing the share of people that were born in a town that was coded as urban at the time of their birth. So here, as you can see, there is a little 
overestimation of urbanization in the genealogies. But actually, this is mostly due to the fact that Bayrock is underestimating urbanization. Bayrock is simply looking at whether towns were above or below 5,000 inhabitants. And basically, like he's, he's missing a lot of towns that are close to 5,000 inhabitants. And so he's underestimating urbanization. And basically, when, when we look at, uh, uh, at census data, uh, this is the urbanization rate we get from, uh, from, uh, from census data. And it's actually very similar to, uh, so here, this is in France. Uh, and so looking at census data, it's, we get very similar uh, pattern over time in the census data is only available um, from the eight, uh, from 1793. Um, okay, and, and finally, this is uh, fertility uh, in Europe comparing the genealogies to Colin Watkins data. Um, and here, this is uh, the marital fertility index in Colin Watkins. Um, which, which, which makes sense because I mean, it makes sense to compare fertility in the crowdsource data to the marital fertility index because uh, in the crowdsource genealogies, this is conditional on having at least one child. So we could guess that most of these people were married in the genealogies. Okay, and then we can do it at a at the sub uh, at the sub European level for each region. So for British Isles, for Central Europe and Low Countries for Eastern Europe or France, Northern Europe, Southern Europe. So here, this is looking at life expectancy, um, at uh, adult life expectancy at age 30. Um, again, uh, urbanization um, in, in, in all of these regions and uh, fertility in all of these regions. And so as you can see in Southern Europe, it's not so good and Eastern Europe too, but, but we, we can learn a lot from this data. Um, okay. Okay, so um, then I, I, I fertility is, is initially why I, I was looking at this. And so I'm, I'm going to do an even more careful evaluation of, of, of selection um, by, by looking at fertility. And so on top of census data from Colin Watkins, I leveraged two additional sources from family reconstitution in France and in England. So you can see France on the left panel and England on the right panel. Uh, and so we've already seen the marital fertility index of Colin Watkins, which is in pink, and the crowdsource data. But then I add uh, two different sources. The first one is complete family reconstitution in a limited number of villages. So this is uh, the Louis Henri and Brigley stuff. Uh, and so basically, uh, in France, it will be complete family reconstitution in 40 different uh, rural parishes. Um, in, in England, this will be family reconstitution of 26 parishes from Wrigley L. Uh, and so this will be the dash dots line. Um, and second, I also look at uh, an extraction of aggregate statistics in a large number of towns, including cities, which is only available in England and is a more representative uh, uh, source. And so this comes from uh, Wrigley and Scofield in England, and this is what you get there. And so Basically, as, as you would expect from, uh, from the uh, Lyonry and Wrigley data, which is, again is, is a great source, but there's kind of an underestimation of fertility and it's somewhat noisy data, which we can guess is, is, is not necessarily a representative sample of France as a whole, because it's only small rural parishes. Uh, and so this is what you get here. So for, in France, in, from Lyonry and in England from uh, Wrigley and Al. But then when you look at the ag aggregative extractions from uh, the 400 parishes in, in Wrigley and Scofield, uh, you get a very similar uh, time evolution to the genealogies uh, in England, so, which is reassuring. Uh, Guillaume? Yes? Uh, so, sorry, sorry, so Lee has a clarifying question, but his mic doesn't work. So uh, he asked whether this is total or marital fertility that you're plotting on your graphs. Oh, yes. Uh, so in the genealogies, <clears throat> this is completed fertility. Uh, so it, it is somewhat close to marital fertility or total fertility. It's a different measure. Uh, so it's conditional it on having at least to, one It child. can't be close to both. I'm uh, sorry? It can't be close to both marital fertility and total fertility. Because lots of people don't get married. 
Yes, I, I don't know if they got married. So marital, or... I mean, marital fertility and total fertility are quite different denominators. Yeah. No, no. So I, I don't know if they got married or not in the in the genealogies. I only okay. look at their level of fertility yeah. and it's conditional on having at least one child. Yeah. So it's it's a very different type of mirror. Uh, but in any case, it looks similar to marital fertility uh, when you compare it to marital fertility. Somewhat similar. Um, yes. Um, okay. So um, then I, I, I document uh, some stylized facts within this data. Um, so uh, I do that at the European level and also at a more disaggregated level to, to capture some changes not necessarily seen in aggregate level statistics. And basically I ask what is the evolution of human mobility, fertility and adult mortality over the long run in Europe and are known facts found in the data, okay? So at the level of Europe, the first realized fact is that in the early 19th century, there was a rural flight into urban centers. So this was already known, but we can document it in a pretty nice way. So here, this is looking at the log distance from birth to death in the data. Um, and here, uh, I'm plotting the median log distance from birth to death uh, over time. Uh, and you can see a, a, a big jump uh, starting from the 1820s. So this is in all of Europe as a whole. Uh, this is a mean, uh, and this is a 75th percentile. Um, okay. So this is basically capturing the rural flight and, and urbanization. The second stylized fact, or also it's already known, is that in the late 19th century, there is an important decline in fertility in Europe. Um, so, okay, so this is uh, fertility in Europe as a whole, and, and basically it went from about five children per woman to uh, three children uh, in, the, in the early 20th century. Um, and the third still fact is that in the mid 19th century, Europeans experienced an unprecedented increase in adult life expectancy. And again, this was already known, but here this is showing uh, life expectancy at 30 in the data. Uh, and and you know, we can see the effect of the two world wars. Um, uh, probably there's a bit of an overrepresentation of, of persons that died during World War II in, in this data. But, but you know, this is just confirming things we already know, we already knew. Okay, then at a more disaggregated level, uh, and here I'm gonna focus on fertility especially. Um, so the fourth still fact will be that um, the decline in fertility in France took place more than a century before the rest of Europe. And so this is already known, but I find the decline in fertility slightly earlier than previously thought. So, um, I find that in France, the decline in fertility took hold in the 1760s, which is 15 years before previously estimated. In, in Louis Henri, uh, uh, he finds that the decline in fertility started in the 17, in 1776. Um, and so this is before the French Revolution and more than 100 years before the rest of Europe. So here you can see in this, in this graph, the number of children over time in the genealogies in France and in England and Wales. And you can see a very striking difference. Um, with a very early decline in fertility. Um, and so this has been a puzzle for a long time. So in a, in a different paper of mine, um, which will be one of my job market papers next year, I argue that de-Christianization played a major role in, in this decline in fertility. Um, okay. So the second, uh, fifth stylized fact is that in Europe, there was a process of cultural diffusion from France of the decline in fertility. Um, again, this was a known fact uh, but here I'm able to observe the entire process of diffusion. So Spolar and Bagjar in, 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 in a recent paper uh, that's uh, 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 forthcoming at uh, Economic Journal, uh, look at the effect of linguistic distance from French on fertility across regions in Europe. And they argue that places that are more culturally distant uh, have experienced experienced a, a later demographic transition uh, and places that are close culturally to France experience an earlier demographic transition. The example, like the, the most known example being Belgium um, in which the French speaking parts experience a much earlier decline in fertility than France. And so here I'm just replicating Spolar and Agjar with my uh, individual level data. So this is the same specification with uh, with decade fixed effects, uh, country fixed effects. 
And just showing uh, the effect of linguistic distance from French on fertility uh, across, uh, across regions uh, in the data. And so in the paper, they show uh, the process of diffusion after the 1830s, because this is when the data is available. Colin Watkins data only starts in the 1830s. And so basically they show that linguistic distance has a positive effect on fertility, but they can only show it starting from the 1830s. So basically they, I don't know if you can see my, my pointer, this is, they can only show these parts. Um, and then like once everyone has adopted the, the norm of lower fertility, then basically the effect of linguistic distance goes to zero. Here, I'm able to show the entire process of diffusion and I'm able to show that before the decline in fertility in France started again in the 1760s, there is no effect or a slightly negative effect of linguistic distance from French on fertility in Europe. And then the effect of linguistic distance increases over time and it reaches a maximum in the 1850s, 18, 1870s, and then it declines. So I'm able to observe the entire process of diffusion. Um, okay, and, and finally, uh, uh, still as fact number six, and this one is completely new, uh, there, there is a weaker intergenerational persistence of fertility as early as in the 18th century in Europe. Okay, so basically this, uh, this figure is, is uh, using the fact that we have intergenerational matches. And so this is looking at the coefficients on the log fertility of parents on the log fertility of individuals in the data. Um, so this is the intergenerational coefficient. And um, in this regression, I have a decade fixed effect accounting for the time variation, and I have country by decade fixed effect. So accounting for all of the time variation for each country, for each different country. And, and what I find is very surprising. I find an, a weaker intergenerational persistence in Europe after the 1770s at a time period when the aggregate fertility did not decline. So in, in that, in the second time period, in the, starting from the 1850s, there is a decline in fertility taking place. In the, the second decline in fertility here uh, takes place at this Time. And so it's not surprising that there's a decline in intergenerational persistence because there's a change in the education or income fertility gradients. And also there's a lot of, of, of distributional changes taking place at the time of the decline in fertility. And so Tom Vogel has a paper showing exactly that, that when there's an aggregate level decline, uh, intergenerational per persistence breaks down. However, what's very surprising is that very early in the 18th century, starting from the 1770s or 1750s, uh, there is a weaker intergenerational persistence going from 0.35 to roughly 0.25. And so this is very surprising because here the time variation is accounted for uh, with decade fixed effects in the regression. So this is not due to any time changes. Um, and so one hypothesis, and I'm, I'm not going to go further than hypothesizing, is that this may be because of distributional changes in preferences or in income following the Enlightenment or the Industrial Revolution. Um, but again, uh, in this paper, I'm not going to have any uh, sort of explanation for that. Um, okay. Okay. So. Um, you know, these were some of the stylized facts that we can uh, document uh, using this data, um, but, but you, you can do much more. Uh, and so basically this is a novel historical individual level data set, uh, cleaned and ready to use, or at least it will be uh, uh, whenever, uh, if ever I publish this paper, hopefully soon. Uh, and, and I do a careful country by country evaluation of sample selection, which, which is very important. Also trying to compare it to uh, over sources to the Colin Watkins Princeton project data to, um, to family reconstitution. And, and finally, I use, um, I, I document some CLS facts uh, using the genealogist. And so I guess you can scan this uh, little thing. Thank you.